This video is sponsored by PCBWay. Hello there and welcome back to another video. Recently, I was able to dig through a tech recycling pile at my workplace and I managed to find a couple of interesting things to take from it before it was all sent off. What I ended up coming home with were two old UPS units. The first of the two being this 1U rack mount unit from CyberPower and the second being this APC Back UPS Pro 1500. I also managed to snag a big external battery expansion for the APC unit, which after doing some testing off camera, seems to be in perfect working order. But because it's in good condition, it's not really the focus for today's video. What I am going to be focusing on today are the other two UPS units that I salvaged, because while they do seem to be mostly functional, they most definitely need their batteries replaced, and today, I'm going to be doing that on the cheap. Starting out with the smaller CyberPower UPS, the issue with this UPS is that when plugged in, it acts like it's charging and the charge percentage very slowly increases. However, the moment it's unplugged, even if I let it go above 70% charge, it dies, and when plugged back in, it's back to being 0% charged. Based on what I could find online, this is standard behavior for this model when the batteries are completely destroyed, so let's take a look at what batteries it uses and see if we can get some replacements. With the top pulled off of the unit, we can see that this uses two DJW 6-7.0 batteries, which are 6 volt, 7 amp hour battery cells. Looking online, good replacements for these should cost about $15 a battery, and so I ordered two replacements for just over $30 in total. And with that order placed, it is at this point that I should warn you, pulling the top off of a unit like this is something you should only do if you're aware of the risk that some of the components in the UPS's circuitry could be energized by the batteries. And because of that, there's still a chance of high voltage being present in the unit, even when it's completely unplugged. And while that warning is important, as I'll soon find out, Taking the top off of this unit is actually not necessary at all to replace the batteries, and so if you're following along at home on a similar unit, you likely won't have to do anything that will expose any potentially high voltage circuitry. Just leave the top panel on and only worry about the stuff that I do with the panels on the front of the unit and sliding things in and out of the front, as that's all that's actually needed to replace the batteries. So to get the old batteries out, I learned after taking the top off that you can actually just unclip the front plastic piece and unscrew a small metal cover, allowing you to pull out the tray with the two batteries on it. You do have to disconnect the batteries from the unit, but there are some easy to use quick disconnects for that. It's really nice that CyberPower has made it easy to replace the battery in this unit, and also that they sell replacement battery packs for this unit online, because I really do think this is the right way to do things other than making people throw out the whole unit. However, the official battery pack for this UPS costs $80 from CyberPower, and we've already established that buying individual cells is a lot cheaper. So really what we'll be doing today, instead of replacing the battery pack, is rebuilding it with new cells, saving us a ton of money. After ripping the double-sided tape that held the old cells to the tray, I was able to look at the way that they were wired and then remove all of the cabling so that the cells could be swapped out. These two 6-volt cells are wired in series, creating a 12-volt, 7-amp-hour battery pack. And just for the fun of it, after everything was unwired, I grabbed a multimeter and set it to DC volts to check the voltage of the old batteries. One battery was at about 2.8 volts, and the other was at 4.4, both very dead. And even though lead-acid batteries are usually rechargeable, once they go below a certain voltage, they become damaged by over-discharge, and so these batteries are both well below that threshold, and therefore can't be used. Another thing you might have noticed is that there is a pretty big difference between the two voltages in these cells, even though they were wired together in series, meaning they were charged and discharged together. This is not too surprising though, as throughout the lifetime of a series battery pack like this, the cell's voltages will drift apart due to cell-to-cell -cell discrepancies in their chemistries and constructions. And this brings me to the next thing that's important here, making sure that when we put the new two cells in, they're both charged to a very similar voltage. If there's a significant voltage difference between the new cells, more than about 0.2 volts, this starting offset can accelerate the rate at which their voltages drift, and one cell gets destroyed by being undercharged. If this is the case with your cells, it's a good idea to charge them both to full so that their voltages will match before putting them in, and I'll have a quick tutorial on how to do this with a bench power supply when I get to the other UPS unit in this video. Moving on though, my cells were in good shape with similar voltages, so I wired them in series exactly like the old cells were and put them back on the tray. I also secured them with some electrical tape so that they wouldn't rattle around. My final note about these exact 
placement cells that I used is that their terminals were a bit smaller than the ones on the old cells. Due to the way that spade terminals work, I was able to crush the connectors on the wires to make sure they still made good contact, but maybe buy different cells than these ones if you're working on a similar unit. After getting the new pack installed, however, I powered the unit on and was very pleased to see that it recognized the cells as charged and that when I unplugged it from the wall, even with a desktop PC plugged in as the load, it switched over to battery and powered the computer perfectly fine instead of instantly dying. So yay, UPS one of two fixed and for only 30 bucks in batteries. I'd consider that a major win considering a new one of these UPS units is priced at $220 right now on Amazon and the official replacement batteries cost 80 bucks on their own. So now let's move on to the bigger APC UPS and see what can be done over there. But first, if you're interested in fixing devices like this, I think that you might be interested in today's video sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay is a company that offers all kinds of custom manufacturing services that can be helpful when fixing things. Need a small PCB to replace one that's busted? Check out their custom PCB manufacturing services. Got a broken plastic part? Sketch up a 3D model of the part and send it off to PCBWay to have it 3D printed in all sorts of different materials. Or even if you need a piece of sheet metal or a machined part, PCBWay offers sheet metal production services and CNC machining services. So feel free to check those out as well. If you're like me and like to fix things, PCBWay should be on your radar in case you need that custom manufactured part professionally and affordably done. Check them out at my referral link in the video description and thank you again to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. This APC UPS is kind of similar in its issue to the other one. However, when it's plugged in, it beeps loudly and even after being left for a long time, it refuses to charge. Off camera, I tried removing its internal battery and plugging just the external battery pack into it and this ended up working perfectly fine. So again, I'm very confident that this is just another case of an aged battery. Getting the battery out of this unit is really easy as there's a little door on the bottom of the UPS that you can slide open, revealing the battery pack. Then, the pull tabs can be used to remove the battery, and voila, the battery has been removed. You can order these exact replacement batteries from APC, though they cost about $110. There are identical looking aftermarket battery packs that seem to range from $55 to $60, which are actually not bad deals at all, but I'm gonna do the same thing that I did with the other unit and just replace the cells in order to save as much money as possible. Now, you might be wondering how I'm going to do that because this seems like it's an entirely proprietary battery. And at first glance, I thought exactly the same thing. But after opening up the external battery pack to check all the cell voltages and just to see its construction, I realized that this battery pack is, in reality, just two 12 volt, nine amp hour lead acid cells facing each other with a spacer and wiring harness in between. And then there are some big stickers on the two sides to keep it all together. So after checking the total voltage of this battery, which should be 24 volts and finding out that it's actually measuring at 16, I went out and I found suitable replacement cells and bought two of them for $45 in total. With the two new cells here, I laid them out and maybe the way that this battery pack is constructed is making a little more sense now. The next step will of course be installing the two new batteries into the pack, but first, I actually decided that I want to give a tutorial on how to charge these batteries if your new cells have a voltage discrepancy. Mine don't have any meaningful discrepancy between them, However, knowing how to do this with a benchtop power supply is always helpful. Of course, if you have a dedicated lead acid battery charger, you can just use that, but if you have a bench power supply laying around, it'll do the job just as well. Now, while I'll be using my dual channel bench power supply to charge both of these cells at the same time, I'll just be going over the configuration for one channel because I basically copied that over to the other channel for the other battery. The first step in this process is to make sure your power supply is in the constant current, constant voltage mode and set the current limit of your power supply. Constant current slash constant voltage or CC slash CV mode means that when the set current limit is reached, your power supply will adjust its voltage accordingly to keep at maximum that amount of current flowing constantly. Then once the current draw at the originally set voltage is below the current limit, the power supply switches to providing however much current is being drawn at that constant voltage that you set at the start. You'll want to set the current limit to 20 to 30% of the rated capacity of your battery in amp hours so since these cells are 9 amp hours, I'll set it to about 1.75 amps to be safe, as that puts me 
pretty much right on that 20% mark. Then, voltage wise, for a 12 volt cell, you'll want to set the supply to between 13.8 and 14.4 volts. If you're doing a 6 volt cell, go for somewhere between 7.2 and 7.4. If you're just trying to equalize charge levels in your cells, I would go for somewhere in the middle of these ranges. So, since I'm doing 12 volt cells, I chose a 14 volt charge voltage. Now, you can connect the battery to the power supply. Connect the power supply's positive to the battery's positive, and the power supply's negative to the battery's negative. Take extra care not to flip these polarities, as you risk severely damaging your power supply if you do. When you connect the battery, the current draw on the power supply should shoot up to the current limit that you set, and the output voltage of the power supply should drop below what you set. It shouldn't drop too much below the battery's rated voltage though, as that would be cause for concern in terms of your wiring or charge current and voltage settings. If you're charging a 12 volt battery and the power supply's output voltage drops much below 10 volts, I'd become concerned and I'd become concerned with less than 4.5 volts on a 6 volt battery. As time goes on, the voltage should slowly rise until it hits your originally set charge voltage. At this point, the charge current should slowly drop, and once it drops to around 3% of the battery's rated capacity in amp hours, the battery is fully charged. I cut my batteries off at 0.3 amps of current flow, just above 3% of the 9 amp hour rating. And just like that, your batteries are charged. Take note that mine went through this process very quickly because they were already quite charged, and if your batteries have been discharged, they will take a lot longer to get to the point where your power supply switches out of constant current mode. Also, don't leave this charging process unattended, because while lead acid batteries are one of the safer batteries to charge, there is still the possibility of something going wrong, and it's very important to be able to take action if that does happen. Finally, moving on to building the new battery pack, I used a knife to cut the stickers right next to the plastic spacer in the middle of the two batteries. I was then able to remove the wiring, of course taking note of how the cells were oriented and wired originally to make reassembly easier, and then I removed the spacer and its cables. The two old cells can now go off to a recycling center, and here's a fun note, a lot of junkyards or recycling places will pay for lead acid cells by the pound because of how recyclable they are. If you want to get a few more dollars back on your UPS repair, take the old cells to a place and have them pay you scrap value for them. I then reassembled the battery pack using my two new cells, following the original positioning and wiring, and taking care to get all of the polarities correct. Then, I wrapped the pack in some electrical tape so that it would hold its shape better. A tip for this is to keep the electrical tape taut while wrapping the batteries, as electrical tape stretches. And if you keep it partially stretched while wrapping the batteries, it will both be harder for it to stretch apart and make the cell all loose and floppy, and it will also clamp the cells together with its stretchiness. With that, I pushed the new pack into the UPS unit and fired it up to give it a test. The UPS was immediately a lot happier with its new battery cells, not flashing and beeping at me like it had been before. Then, when I plugged a load into it and unplugged it from the wall, it powered the load off of battery exactly like it should have. So sweet! Two of two UPS is fixed up and ready to be deployed somewhere in my house. I'm going to put the smaller one down with the networking gear that's located where our internet comes in to keep our access points and router online in a power outage, and the bigger one is going to get connected with its battery expansion to both my server rack and my filming set, so that a power outage won't knock my servers out and also won't ruin a shot if I'm filming. And one more note before I end the video, if you tally up the values of all of these parts online, I scored several hundred dollars worth of UPS units for only about $75 in new battery cells. So I think this little project was an absolute win. Well, that's all that I have to show you in this video. I wanted to show you how easy it can be to fix up an old UPS, both as a way to get a UPS for really, really cheap, and as a way to sustain your current UPS for cheap as well. So, I hope that you were able to at least enjoy the video, and maybe even learn a thing or two. In any case, I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.